This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwa arcade parts. Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the cave. Today I have a question for you which I often ask myself, which is what is it that makes me the most nostalgic about retro computing? What is it that makes the, the feelings bubble up? And it can be any number of things. Sometimes it's just thinking about the unique way in which different companies approached the creation of hardware from Apple to Sinclair. They all did it a little bit differently and it seemed so much more exciting before everything became standardized and we have the IBM PC clones or Apples with similar hardware inside them and even the games consoles now all becoming very similar with the same architecture. Was it the amount of time I seemed to have to use my computers? Now granted I had less responsibilities. It was in the 80s I was a, a kid so I had what seemed like endless summers and weeks and weeks and weeks to just play games and nothing else. And I've got really fond nostalgic memories of that. Or was it the act of physically buying a game? Going into a store, any number of stores, because the high street was just flooded with stores that sold cassette tape games, certainly in the UK, from pharmacists to news agents, everyone seemed to sell them. And picking a game out of, off of a shelf, looking at the cover art, reading the description on the back and comparing the screenshots, and on more than one occasion, I remember reading the back of a game with no screenshots, thinking, yeah, that sounds like a great game, pedaling back furiously to load it up, and then finding I'd actually bought a text adventure. <laughs> there was just no way of knowing sometimes. But that was the risk you took. And sometimes it paid off and sometimes it didn't. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, it's because recently I purchased this. This is Sydney Hunter and the Sacred Tribe for the Commodore 64. It's a brand new physical game, although a digital download is also available from collectorvision.com. That's where I bought it. And I bought this with my own money. This wasn't gifted to the cave or anything like that. What we're gonna to do today is review this game, um, take you through it with a, a typical review, but I'm also gonna keep in mind, how does this compare? How does buying a physical game in 2018 compare to going down the shops in 1988 and picking out a game to play? Can we recapture any of those feelings whatsoever? Or is it just a completely alien and different experience uh, and something that we'll never capture again? An interesting question. But first, let's look at the game and see if it's any good. Well, I'm more than ready to try out my first new 8-bit game in over 30 years. And this one, brace yourselves, it cost me 73 US dollars, including postage. The digital download is $10, so the question is, what do I get for the extra $45 plus shipping? Well, I have to say, my first impressions were pretty mixed. I fully understand economies of scale, a product with a low production run will command a premium price tag but I do, quite reasonably, expect a certain level of quality for the extra I've paid. The artwork is lovely, it has shades of comic books like Lucky Luke or the Belgium comic Les Tuniques Bleu on which the game North v South was based. You'll likely recognise the style if you've ever played that. Inside the box we have some goodies and some not so goodies. There's a poster, some more paper items and the cartridge. And this quality bit of polystyrene. Hmm. The extras are great though, and I love the map signed from one, An Adventure, oh dear, which shows the start of the game with the green cross and we have to make our way all the way down to the red X. They even, it seems, have rights to reproduce the Commodore logo, which adds a bit of authenticity. The poster is the same artwork as we saw on the front of the box, it's a bit of fun. And you'll notice the Exidy name on it, which was a name we saw on games in the 80s. Collector Vision acquired Exidy and Acclaim back in 2016, gaining rights to use the brand name on its own titles. The manual is another nice little publication which presents the objective of the game and other useful information, including pictures of the developers themselves. The highlight for me though is the game cartridge itself. It's this really lovely semi-transparent casing which is really nicely built and, well, authentic, I guess. It also has a reset button built right into it, and there's an LED light which we'll see come to life when we fire it up. I really do like this. Now what I don't like is the box. I mean, come on guys, how much more would it have cost to put this into a quality box? Why not something like this Chuck Yeager box, which would have also been a premium priced product at release, but it has nice thick cardboard. 
and there's a plastic tray into which the cassette is held, which isn't particularly nice, but it's still better than polystyrene. Or if you insist on using thin glossy card, then why not have a sleeve like this P47 cover? I just can't understand why that extra cost couldn't have gone towards a better box. When you're promoting a physical product, you really want the physical aspect of it to come across as well as possible. Oh, that's a nice poster I didn't know I had in P47. Check that out. So yeah, it's not the end of the world, but I do think Collectivision could have done a lot better with that. On then to the game, which does remain the most important part of the whole experience. And here is Sydney Hunter, a game with a nice simple backstory. The intrepid adventurer Sydney has been captured on the Yucatan Peninsula and is being held captive in a pyramid from which he needs to escape. All very Indiana Jones, or indeed Rick Dangerous, if you remember that game. It's not Sydney's only outing, he appears on a multitude of other platforms, all of which can be explored on the Collectivision website. The game is a platformer, in which we need to collect a quota of diamonds in order to pass gatekeepers in the form of tribesmen, who then allow you to progress deeper into the temple, a temple which is very usefully mapped as you progress. Hit the F1 key and you can see the map, which is really useful. It automatically maps out as you progress through the game, and the rooms also show the possible exits in each of them, and you definitely refer back to it quite a lot. The game is running in a high resolution mode for the C64, and the trade off for that is a reduced colour palette, but it's so well stylized it's not left lacking in the looks department. You certainly get a sense of a dark and unforgiving temple environment, which is further emphasised by a moody soundtrack. Comprising of two in game tunes, both with some nice sweeping synth effects, taking advantage of the C64 SID chip. If this wasn't a multi platform franchise, I'd almost wish they'd called it Sydney Hunter spelled with an S, I, and a D. To really appreciate the visuals, this game should be seen on a CRT, the effects really taking advantage of the bleeding and blending of the old technology, like this glowing effect around the burning torches, which really looks great on my old Sony television. The game mechanics are intuitive, with things like quicksand proving a danger, as well as a method of passing low-flying enemies, and doors, ladders and vines enable you to navigate around the various rooms. Climbing can be troublesome at times, you have to get Sydney in just the right spot for the ladders to be detected, which is sometimes frustrating. You can't just jump and grab hold of the ladders, although you can with the vines. But you can change direction mid-jump, which is a technique you need to perfect to grab some of the crystals and progress through the temple. I was quite enjoying myself in these early stages, it was nice and easy to explore and get the hang of the game without losing too many lives, and by using the map I methodically explored all of the rooms and soon had 60 diamonds needed to progress past the first tribesman. Now what I was expecting next was for the difficulty to ramp up in true 8-bit gaming fashion. I was expecting to be frustrated by rooms with relentless difficulty, which needed pixel-perfect accuracy and timing, but it just didn't happen. I wouldn't call this game easy, but it was far from challenging. There are plenty of opportunities to collect extra lives as you progress through the game, and yes I lost them as I went through the game, but that was really through sloppiness and lack of concentration as opposed to a hardcore challenge. On one playthrough, after about 40 minutes in, I found myself with a completed map save for one room, with 149 diamonds and 150 needed to escape. And that's when it dawned on me, perhaps the challenge here isn't simply making it to the end of the temple, it's doing it by having been thorough enough to get every single diamond, and now the challenge would be backtracking through perhaps the entire temple to find that one missing diamond. Now just to forewarn you, there will be some spoilers now. Firstly, you can only backtrack, as far as I can see, halfway through the temple, so that saves a little bit of time. And secondly, there wasn't a diamond to be found, there were 20 hidden away in a chest in a secret area here. Which took me to the most challenging sequence in the game. Now this is what I was expecting more of. Enemies well positioned to need a perfectly executed series of jumps, our prize in a chest which needed to be quickly grabbed, and then a swift exit in order to catch the enemies in the right formation to make it possible. And that was proper old-fashioned platform gaming, giving me all the diamonds I needed for the last room. And that sequence really was the highlight of the game for me, because the final room was something of an anticlimax. 
I was clinging on to my last life, so I was playing it extra cautiously, peeking into the room a few times to figure out the pattern of danger that needed to be navigated. And then I went for it. Which was really great, but again, without the challenge it wasn't an achievement. I didn't feel as if I'd really had to work hard for it. And within the hour, the game was complete. So first and foremost, having a game, physical or not, the most important thing is did you have fun? And yes I did. I never felt that anything about this game was unachievably frustrating, not like say parts of Manic Miner or Jet Set Willy. Similar um, platform games that anyone who's played will know how frustrating they can be. But at the other end of the scale, it didn't really feel challenging enough. If anything, it was a little bit too easy. It only took me a few tries and on the try that I completed the game on, it took 40 minutes, maybe 45 minutes to complete, and there are a lot quicker gamers than me out there. I dare say some of you will have it completed in 35 minutes. Um, so it's not particularly challenging, and it showed so much potential in, in one screen in particular, which I showed you in the review, that it's perfectly capable of being a more challenging game, perhaps a slightly more frustrating game. But then if they introduced save codes or, or something like that, that frustration can be alleviated while still giving you a challenge. Now, this particular game aside, Sydney Hunter aside, what was it like buying a physical game in 2018? I have to say, I absolutely loved it. There's so much to be said for having a physical copy of a game, all of the trinkets that go inside it, being able to put up a, a map on the wall behind the screen when you're playing. When was the last time that you did that? Um, and look up it, it, and see the map and see where you are. Yes, I know there's a map in the game, but it's so much nicer to look up at the physical thing. And um, even before you play the game, to take out the manual and the trinkets and the map and to have a sense of the lore that surrounds the game and feel almost a part of it before you've even played it, to give yourself the anticipation of being Sydney Hunter and uh, playing through the game. And that applies to so many old games back in the day, games like Elite. You remember you'd have the star map and a, a huge weighty manual to go with it. Um, or flight sims where you'd have a map of the area where you were playing. Manuals in Grand Prix that would show you the circuits that you had to race on and teach you about setting up your car. All of these things that prepare you for the game before you even play the game. They, they're all things that make a physical game so special and they're still special in 2018. Yeah, I would highly recommend to all of you to, to buy a physical game. Not necessarily this one, but just keep your eyes peeled for games for your favourite system to support the developers and to buy yourself something special that just for once after a, a very long time you can put on your shelf and you can look at and you can smile at and you can touch, you can stroke, <laughs> you can uh, put into the cassette deck or the disc drive or the cartridge slot and hear and feel all of those old noises, those clicks, those grinding noises of the tape going around, hopefully not grinding too much but you know what I mean and relive that old experience because there is still something to be captured there from the old days. I'm glad I tried it and I'm going to try it again for sure. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed today's episode and take care. These lovely patrons on the screen are the reason why Retro Man Cave is possible. If you'd like to join them in contributing to the channel then check out the Patreon link in the description.